You know, I, I had an opportunity. We're going to have a guest speaker today, and I just want to say a couple words. First off, I asked Justin to preach Father's Day last year, and he wasn't quite ready. So the reason I asked him, though, was because I see the example he is makes as a father and what he does. And I, I, I he tell you know he talks about some of the things he does with his children. And all and I, I see a great role model for children, his children, and I know um, he's a blessing to his family. And I thought, what better person to have? to bring the Father's Day message than someone that's actually doing it and living it out and doing it in an awesome way. So give uh, Justin a warm welcome. Uh, I want to pray for you. Let's all go to the Lord in prayer for Justin. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are raising this man up, and Lord, he's leading his family in a way that's pleasing to you, in a way that's growing his children up to be um, the man and woman that you created them to be, Lord. So Lord, just continue to give him patience, give him the love, and, and give him the understanding and, and the compassion for his children and his wife. Lord, as they go through this with these five children that he's raising, Lord, it's a difficult thing, as Lena said, to raise godly children in an ungodly world lord so lord we just pray for him and just give him the leadership skills he needs and lord as he brings this message lord i pray that you just anoint him with a fresh filling of the power of your holy spirit allow him to speak your truth in love and lord you must increase and he must decrease lord loose his tongue to speak as if you were up here jesus use him for your glory lord and lord we pray that you prepare the hearts of the people that are ready to hear the message lord that your word would pierce to the soul lord to the, and lord just lord let it bring about a change where we need to be changed lord and lord just pray that you just let your peace fall on him as you lead as he leads us with this sermon lord in jesus name we pray amen All right, so before I start, uh, I'm just going to say a quick prayer. It's really been a battle all week um, to not run from the stage. Um, there, there's so much uh, that goes into delivering a sermon. Um, there's a responsibility to uh, give God's word in the correct way. I mean, right now I have the head of the boat, and if I steer the wrong way, we could crash. So it's a responsibility as followers of Jesus, as men and women, to pursue the Lord in his righteousness. So I'm going to say a quick prayer, and then uh, we'll get into it. Um, Heavenly Father, I uh, thank you for who you are, a compassionate God. Um, Lord, just send your Holy Spirit to move, because we can't do it without you. We're in desperate need of you in this sinful world that's trying to destroy us and trying to tell us lies about who we are. Lord, just show up and send your spirit to, to, to give us joy, to uh, convict if there's conviction that needs to be, to be given, to encourage. Lord, we just need you to move. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so like Pastor Paul said, um, last year I switched to the day shift, which has been a blessing in itself. Anybody who's worked nights, knows how hard that can be on a family. Um, it's not easy, especially when you have five kids. That is, that is uh, work. Um, and when he asked me to do it, in all honesty, I, I quenched the spirit because I was, I was thinking that I had to muscle my way through it, that God almost couldn't use me in that moment. And I ran from it. I, I ran from it. So when he asked me this year, I kind of gave him a little smirk. And was just like, yeah, yeah, here we are again, a year later. Let's do it. Um, so just remember that before we get into the sermon. God can use you. It's not about us. We just have to be vessels willing to be obedient to the will of God. 
and he is capable. It's not, it's not you muscling like you're doing a pull-up, like, I got to pull myself up. No, he does it for you. So um, I'll start. Happy Father's Day to all the men who are raising their own children and raising children that are not biologically theirs. Men, what a blessing that the Lord has sovereignly given us to be a living sacrifice to them, to remind them of what Jesus can do and what he's done, to testify about his goodness, encourage them relentlessly to pursue after them, to live out the core foundation Jesus has laid out for us, to live a life of prayer, sacrifice, love, mercy, grace, forgiveness, and obedience to God the Father's will. Because the example we set on this earth as men, as fathers, will perceive the way that our children see our Heavenly Father. And that is a big deal. So fathers, let's be intentional. That's a word I wish I learned a long time ago. Uh, be intentional about reminding ourselves because there's so many times in life where we, as men, just tuck things to the side. We don't even encourage ourselves. We don't stop to restore our souls by remembering what, how faithful God has been in our lives. So not only remind yourself, but remind your families and your peers around you about God's faithfulness. Let's love our wives as Christ loved the church. Let's live in community with other men and pray to lead our families in a way of godly thinking and godly action. Praying for one another, confessing our sins, mortifying our flesh, and as we continue to be sanctified, let's do life with men and be a man that prays for the Holy Spirit to do a work in us or start a work in us to, be, to no longer be satisfied with being less than what God has called you to be. As I try to encourage you to lead your homes in a way that followers of Christ should, it would not sit well with me if I didn't confess that I don't always lead my home like that. I have fallen short in the way I, I'm trying to encourage us to lead our homes. I'm guilty of that. But thank God my salvation and our salvation isn't because of we're good enough fathers or good enough mothers. It isn't earned on the performance that we have in life. It isn't providing, uh, let's say, the American dream for our children. It's not material things. It's found in the life, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how our salvation is, 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 is given. It's a gift from God. And it's found in Christ alone. So here's one of my favorite Bible verses. I love this Bible verse. I know everybody has a verse that they can kind of like go to. And it's Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verse 8 through 9. And this is what it says. For grace you have been saved. Stop there. Not of your works. Grace. Through faith. And not of yourselves. It is a gift from God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. I love that verse. It reminds me that I don't have to work for it. It's already been given. All I got to do is put my faith and trust in Christ. Think about, uh, we'll say when you give somebody a gift, do you have to work for it? You don't. It's given. And that's what Christ did on the cross for us. It's given. So just accept it. Um. Throughout life, just remember that you will experience and wrestle with this sinful world. You will win and lose some of these battles in life. But always remember that Jesus has already won the war. The war is over. You're going to lose battles. You're going to win battles. But at the end of the day, Christ has already secured victory. Rejoice in that because that is good news and it's life-changing. So I want to charge you with this uh, verse um, as we, before we get into Luke 15. It's Ephesians 5, 1 th uh, through 2. Did I give you that one? Oh, yeah. Look, I got bad eyes. 
Um, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given us uh, himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. Be imitators of God because you're dearly loved children. Live a life of love. Do that with your marriage, your children, your coworkers. Just live a life of love. Be patient and kind with people. That's going to go a long way. That will expand the kingdom because this is a world that needs love. We need Christ. Um, and that is the way that we're called to live as far as the Jesus and in, in, in men, men in general. Um, so happy Father's Day, men. Um, this year, let's be intentional about leading our families in love, loving our wives like, like no other, um, and pursuing after Christ and remembering that it's not what we do. He's done it. It's done. He's nailed it to the cross. He's walked out the tomb. There's good news, so let's live our lives like that good news is good. All right, so now we're going to go to Luke 15. That's where we're going to be today, all right? Um, So Luke 15 is such an excellent chapter in the book of Luke. There's three parables Jesus told, and there's a common theme that I want you to see. Um, I'm going to start with four questions I want to ask you to keep in the back of your mind. And the questions are, do you have compassion? What do you have compassion for? Do you rejoice? And what do you rejoice in? As we go through Luke 15, keep those questions in mind. As believers, we should have compassion and we should rejoice, but just be careful what you rejoice in. Let me get this out. I didn't give you this one, so I'm just, I'm just going to read it. This is Psalm 5, all right? But let, not those, but let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. He's talking to the Lord. This is, this is David talking to the Lord. Let them shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor, you will surround him with a shield. That is a beautiful, beautiful description of what the Lord does. All right. Uh, Luke, verse 1. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And when they say him, we're talking about Jesus. Jesus is talking and uh, people came up, uh, tax collectors and um, the Pharisees, and they wanted to listen and kind of antagonize Jesus because their hearts are not in the right posture. Uh, And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, this man receives and eats with sinners. Thank God that Jesus does. Um, Look at what the Pharisees and the scribes are complaining to Jesus about what he's doing. They sound like people who believe they are better than the others around him, having no compassion for people who are not them. Church, don't be a Pharisee. Have compassion and love for people. You don't know the internal battle that someone's wrestling with. They could be sitting beside you right now in church and you you don't know. Um, Ephesians 4, I'm I'm gonna get into that, all right? Ephesians 4 states, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. I love that because it's just a reminder again that Christ forgave you. Just put your trust in him. So in saying that, if you have children and you know how, if, if you have children, you do not have compassion for them. You're not parenting correctly. If you have a marriage and there's no compassion there, you're not doing marriage correctly. If you work at a place and they don't see you as a compassionate person, be careful. If you claim to follow Jesus 
and you do not have compassion, I don't know if you are. If you have, comp if you have compassion for God's creation, if you don't have compassion for God's creation, repent, turn away from the hardened heart that you have and pray for God to soften it and he will give you a new heart. Allow yourself to be a willing vessel used by God for, for his kingdom, just like Jesus does. Mm -mm. Sorry. Uh, Luke verses three, and I'm gonna go from three to 10. So he spoke this parable to them saying, what men of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not lead the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. And when he finds, when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. Let me pause right there real quick. Rejoicing. What do you have joy in? Just wrestle with that. Remember, keep that in the back of your mind because we, we all have joy in something. Let's make sure that we put our joy in the right thing and we're not creating idols. All right, keep going. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having 10 silver coins, uh, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me for I have found a peace which I have lost. Likewise, I say to you, there will be joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. I'm going to pause right there because we went through the two parables and I want you to see something. Both parables, somebody lost something. The shepherd lost a sheep. The woman lost the coin. The shepherd, he's looking for his sheep. The woman is looking for her coin. Then the shepherd rejoices with friends and neighbors over the found sheep. The woman then rejoices over with friends and neighbors over the found coin. And it ends with this. The shepherd says, joy in heaven over sinner who repents. And the woman, there is joy in the presence of angels and God over the repentant sinner. Church, do we rejoice in the rebel who surrenders? The rebel who surrenders, that's us. that was once us or is us. Rebels against God. Do we rejoice in the one that repents? Do we rejoice in the work that the Lord is doing in their life and also ours? Church, we should. We really should. So now let's get to the third parable. I'm going to go 11 through 16. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to, to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a, serve, a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to the swine. And when he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, 
How many of my father's hired servants have bread? Enough to spare. And I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you. Heaven, oh, I'm sorry. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So I'm going to pause there, kind of walk through this with you. Here we have the younger brother request a portion of his goods from his father, and his father lovingly gives it to him. And what does a younger brother do? I mean, we've all been here. We've wasted it on lavish lifestyles in a land of people with no compassion for one another. Where are you at? Uh, I'm picking up in verse 19. And, no, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Keep going. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Keep going. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf here and kill it and let's, be, let's eat and be merry. For this, my son, for this, my son was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and now and is found. They began to be merry. And pause there. This is repent, where repentance started. The younger brother had a changing of his mind. That's what first changed. It was his mind. He realized he had become a citizen of a kingdom that he had no parts of being. It's almost like he gave one kingdom up for another. I know in my life I've done that. It's also a beautiful illustration of what repentance looks like. It's a turning away from sinful ways, a turning away from prodigal living, an about face, running to your Savior, knowing who you are and knowing who He is with the desire of restoration that only Jesus can provide. After the repentance and restoration, look at how the Father responds to the once rebellious son. He gave him the best robe. He gave him a ring for his hand. He put sandals on his feet and threw a celebration. He rejoiced. I remember, um, we'll say a while ago, my wife, uh, she's been such a blessing to me. Um, Sometimes, like, the Holy Spirit just speaks to her and puts me in my place. <laughs> and I'm sure I, I hear a couple men chuckling. They know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and what happened was, um, is I used to play sports growing up, and I played travel basketball. Very competitive. And my son plays soccer. He is very good at what he does. And uh, he had learned a new move. And we were working on kicking the ball with his left foot so he can kick with both feet. And he came up to me so proud, so proud. And instead of rejoicing with him, I tried to push him to the next task to be a better soccer player. And the Holy Spirit working in my wife said, hey, Justin, come here. Let me talk to you. And I'm like, what's up, babe? And she's just like, you know, sometimes you should live in the joy of that moment right there. That was an accomplishment. And that's what the scripture's saying. Dude, we got to rejoice. Rejoice in your marriage. Rejoice in your children. Rejoice in this church. Rejoice in your workplace. Rejoice in the Lord because he sovereignly gave you this. And it's yours to steward. So let's steward it well. 
Um, so yeah, she told me that, and uh, it hit me. And I think I, I ran up to Noah and apologized to him. And uh, it stuck with me ever since. So I try not to push to the next task, because I'm a guy that, hey, you give me a list, you give me a to-do list, baby, I'm knocking that out. Like, one thing at a time. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's go. And at times in this world where uh, we'll say we live in a microwave world and we have a crockpot God, it's, it's okay to settle and be in that moment as things stew and cook up into their perfection until the Lord says it's ready. The microwave is so convenient. You put something in it, you can decide when you want to take it out. You know when it's going to end. You're in control of that. You're sovereign over that. But that crock pot, it don't work like that. It don't work like that at all. So just try to remember to rejoice in the things that the Lord has given you. Uh, just like in all three parables, there's a celebration after the subject is found and heaven and God rejoice over the repentive sinner. Uh, I'm going to read 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked, what things, what these things meant? And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed a fattened calf. But he, as in the brother, was angry and would not go in. Therefore, the father came out and pleaded with him. This father has a heart that's postured correctly. I see the posture of this father's heart and look at my own and, and know that I've failed here more times than I can count. One son didn't feel worthy and the other felt entitled. Our Heavenly Father, He is compassionate. He has love for His children. He is love. He is compassion. I can give you this one, but I'm going to read uh, Psalm 145, verse 8. And this verse says, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies over all his works. Love that. This scripture here, it's telling you, it's telling you who the Lord is. He's compassionate. He's slow to anger. Great in mercy. He's good and his mercies are tender. That is a God that I will follow for the rest of my life. That's not a God of works. That is a God of mercy, of love. I'm gonna read 31. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. And it was right there, we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Church, this has to be, church, we have to, we must be people who rejoice and people who have lost and that are found. Through life, we're all going to wrestle with things, whether internal or external. I guarantee that. But it's our job to love God and love people, to be compassionate, to rejoice in the repentant sinner, and to lead people right to Jesus for restoration. That is our job. I love that. I love to hear about people and how God moved in their life. I'm sure you do too. It restores my soul. So please, share with each other what God is doing in your life. Share your struggles with each other too. Hmm. 
Hmm. So I dropped the ball here. Uh, and I got my papers mixed up. When I, I'm going to go back to verse 29 and 30. All right. And what I want you to see here is um, the older brother, angry, is explaining to his father that he's been in the house the whole time. This is a scary mind frame. And remember who Jesus is telling the parable to. He's telling them to the Pharisees. These are men that uh, don't see Jesus as Lord, who don't believe Jesus is there as the Messiah. They believe in the law and the law bringing fulfillment and restoration. This is a scary mind frame of the older brother and it's symbolic of the Pharisee. They both feel as if they are owed by the father for the works that they've done. That is a heart that is hardened and we can't rejoice in, if we can't rejoice in the work that God does in us and the work around us, we've fallen into sin. The older brother even reminded, he reminded the father of the younger brother's past. And it's so interesting because when the younger brother came and confessed to him, the father never reminded him. He just rejoiced that his son had came back home. Look at the hearts of the two brothers. We have one brother who says, Father, you don't see all that I've done for you? I've been here for years serving you. You owe me. And then you have another, another son that says, Father, I have sinned against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Which one do you see yourself as? That's a question I'm going to ask myself. It's fair to examine ourselves constantly, knowing that Jesus uh, is restoring us and sanctifying us, and he's won the war. So it is our job to love God, to love people, to be compassionate, to rejoice in the repentant sinner, lead people to Jesus for restoration. Jesus lived a sinless life. He was put on the cross for your sin and my sin. Our lies, our stealing, our adultery, our idol worship, our sin. He died on that rugged cross and was buried in the tomb only to raise up three days later defeating death. Now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father and whoever repents and puts their trust in him alone shall be saved. This is the gospel. This is the good news. This is the transforming news that we should live by. That is good news. It's good news that we were once rebels against a God who is sovereign and holy who's all in power and he made a way for us to be adopted into his kingdom. Jesus, he's worthy to be praised. And if you need prayer, a hug, someone to talk to, we the church, we can help. We can help with these needs. So please don't struggle in silence. Come talk to someone in this room, or if you're online, reach out to us. Because us, the church, we love people. We're supposed to be compassionate about people, and we are. So don't struggle in silence. There's a, a movie I really enjoy. It's uh, the Creed series. I love Rocky Balboa. Picked it up with Creed. Love it. I'm a big boxing fan. Glad Tank Davis won last night. It was great. Um, but there's a scene in the second Rocky movie that I, uh, a second uh, Creed movie that I love. And what happens is Creed fights, um, uh, he fights, I forget the, the guy's name. I forget his name, but um, he loses, loses bad. Um, and he's trying to put himself back together. And there's a scene where he's at a pool and he's practicing his boxing and he's just kind of moseying all around and he falls to the bottom of the water. And as he falls to the bottom of the water, he begins to scream. But what's crazy is he's screaming and nobody's hearing him. And I don't want that for, for, for people. We don't want that for people. So if you're struggling with anything, let someone know. 
so you can get help. Um, that's all I have. I'm going to close in prayer, um, and the worship team can come back up. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, not walking out because it's a new speaker. <laughs> Love that. Um, but um, I just pray that this message warms you well as it's Father's Day. Um, I know as a father, you know, there's, there's certain things, it's, and especially as a man or as a follower of Jesus, this world is so against us. This world is uh, raging a war against us about uh, what a man should be, what he should look like, or what a follower of Jesus should be or what he should look like. But it's so interesting because for whatever reason, the world thinks it has authority, and it, it's just confused. It doesn't have any authority. The authority is found in God, God alone. Um, so yeah, uh, Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for these people. Thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, everything that you're going to do. Um, Holy Spirit, please uh, remind us to rejoice and be compassionate to people. Um, encourage us to live out the gospel. Encourage us to love our wives well, to love our children well. Encourage us to pursue you relentlessly. Lord, we love you. We thank you again. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.